Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Despite all the work that the Brady Court did in laying down ground rules to govern plea bargains in the United States in the future, the Brady Court never really made the reason for its embrace of plea bargaining explicit. That was left to the next term of the court in the following year when Chief Justice Berger made that reason explicit uh, in an opinion in a case called Santabello versus New York. Chief Justice Berger said plea bargaining is an essential component of the administration of justice. Properly administered, it's to be encouraged. And here's the crucial sentence. If every criminal charge were subject to a full-scale trial, we would need to multiply by many times the number of judges and court facilities. Berger knew, as everybody did, that the people were not about to increase by many times the number of judges and court facilities, and thus plea bargaining was an essential component of the administration of justice. Without it, the system would collapse, and there was nothing remotely within the budgetary bounds of the system as we know it that could come in to replace it. So it was essential that the plea bargaining system be preserved, at least until something better could be devised, if ever. But that also meant that it needed to be regulated, both so that it worked well and that it didn't do injustices to the people represented by the prosecution or to defendants themselves in the bargaining process. That very case, Santabello versus New York, <clears throat> concerned a man, Rudy Santabello, who was charged with a series of low-level gambling offenses in Brooklyn. He'd been through the criminal justice system before and knew how this sort of thing worked, and so he agreed to plead guilty with a prosecutor if the prosecutor himself would agree not to recommend to the judge at sentencing time that a prison sentence be imposed. The felonies that Santabella was charged with carried a prison sentence, but the sentencing concession was that the prosecutor would not recommend to the judge that Santabello be imprisoned. Through no fault of the prosecutors, as things happen in large bureaucracies, by the time that the case actually came for the plea to be entered, after the plea agreement had been reached, the state was represented by a different prosecutor, and this second prosecutor had apparently not been informed about the bargain that had been made by the previous prosecutor with Santabello. And so when it came time to enter the guilty plea, Santabello pleaded guilty, expecting that the judge would not sentence him to jail because the prosecutor wouldn't recommend so. But to Santabello's surprise, the second prosecutor, unaware of what the first prosecutor had promised, cited Santabello's long record and urged that he be given a one-year jail term, which the judge promptly did. Santabello, that is, expected to be given one plea bargain sentence, and when the actual plea bargain came to be done, he was given a different sentence, a higher sentence. And so he asked the courts to allow him to withdraw, or as they say, reopen his guilty plea and have a chance to plead again, in which case he would presumably not plead guilty uh, in exchange for the same bargain. It's the lemons problem that we saw earlier in the course, now in the context of a plea bargain. If defendants aren't sure that prosecutors will keep their promises in plea bargaining, then the defendants will demand lower sentences from the prosecutors before they agree to plead. Just as in the Lemons case, buyers, knowing that there's uncertainty about the quality of their used cars, will lower the price that they're willing to offer for any used car. And here, here defendants will demand lower sentences to account for the uncertainty that comes with the sense that prosecutors might renege on their promise. And just as in the market for lemons and for cream puffs, behavior of this sort, breaking promises by prosecutors, threatens the existence of the entire plea bargaining system, what we might call the market for guilty pleas. It's possible to see this in terms of the simple equation that we introduced last time. Recall that we said, as we look at the top of the slide, that defendants will plead guilty if the cost to them of the sentence that they'll receive after the plea bargain, marked SPB, is smaller than the expected cost that they face from the prospect of going to trial, 
which is the probability that they'll be convicted multiplied by the consequence to them if they are convicted, which is the cost of the trial sentence ST, which we assume is substantially larger than SPB. But the possibility of a broken promise makes the expected sentence associated with an offer SPB greater than SPB. That is, the possibility that the prosecutor can break his promise makes any plea bargain itself subject to some uncertainty. We thought, or at least we did before cases like this appeared, that when the prosecutor offered a particular sentence, that was that, and the defendant could count on receiving that sentence. And so it was easy to compare the costs of that sentence to the costs of the trial prospect. But now, with the possibility of broken promises by the prosecution, the defendant must add an element of uncertainty to any promise that the prosecutor makes during the plea bargain. And that element of uncertainty, which on the slide I've represented by adding a small or large, depending on the degree of the uncertainty, component H to the plea bargain that the prosecutor says that he or she is going to honor, then, as you can see from the second equation, it's quite possible that the uncertainty will push the cost of the plea bargain above the expected cost of the trial prospect. As you can see in the example, the, if there were no uncertainty, the defendant in this case would accept the plea bargain, but because there is uncertainty and the defendant has to add that little kicker, H, to SPB to account for the uncertainty, it may well be that the plea bargain with the uncertainty is not as good a, tri a, a prospect for the defendant as going to trial itself. And that means that bargains that would have been made without the uncertainty won't be made, and in their stead, costly trials that no one wanted at all will be undertaken in their place. So in order to avoid this result, this threat to the entirety of the plea bargaining system itself, the court voided Santabello's plea and allowed the plea to be reopened to protect the larger system. The vehicle that they had at their disposal to reach this result was the same due process clause of the 14th Amendment that we saw discussed in Magotha versus United States. Here, that same due process of law clause was held to require that prosecutors must keep the promises that they make in bargaining because that's a matter of fundamental fairness. Everybody's supposed to keep the solemn promises that they make, especially in situations as important as this. And so, as in the market for lemons, what's fair and what's efficient are again the same thing. Governing plea bargains, which is what the Supreme Court started to do with the Santabello case, led in the Santabello case to a sort of curbing of a behavior by prosecutors that might threaten the plea bargaining system. But the court didn't mean to suggest that prosecutors couldn't play hardball with defendants in the plea bargaining process. Americans use the expression playing hardball when people actually get down to hard bargaining and don't show much mercy to one another in bargaining to get what they want. Prosecutors routinely play hardball in plea bargains with defendants. And this is because the discount that is given to defendants who agree to plead guilty only has meaning and force to them if defendants who don't accept plea bargains and instead insist on a trial receive substantially higher sentences after a trial conviction than they would have received had they agreed to plead guilty. That's because the only way to induce guilty pleas is to make sure defendants know that they'll be sentenced harshly if they insist on a trial. Put another way, the people who insist on a trial have to be sentenced harshly if they're convicted in order to encourage the next round of defendants to plead guilty uh, to the, uh, in accord with the bargains that the prosecutors are offering. This practice of prosecutorial hardball by threatening, by threatening uh, defendants who insist on a trial with very severe consequences was tested in a case that came before the court in 1978 called Borden-Kirker versus Hayes. 
It arose out of the state of Kentucky, which has what Americans call a three strikes law. There is a baseball umpire on the right signaling the third strike, and after the third strike, a batter in baseball is out. Similarly, after a third strike, a felon is in prison for life. Three strikes laws typically read, as the one in Kentucky did, that after someone has been convicted of a third felony, sometimes a third violent felony, although in Kentucky only a third felony, then, if the prosecutor asks for it, then the court will automatically sentence that person to life imprisonment for the conviction of the third felony. This is obviously meant to deter habitual offenders by effectively saying to them, you get one strike at a low price, a second strike at a low price, but if you get a third strike, the price, no matter what the uh, offense was, will go up very, very high. We don't like habitual offenders will treat them harshly. So along comes Hayes with a long record of minor felonies, including many more than three felony con convictions, and he is accused of passing a bad check in the amount of $88, which is in fact a felony under Kentucky law, but frankly, nothing like an armed robbery or a murder. In order to get a plea agreement, the prosecutor offers this habitual offender a plea bargain with a five-year sentence, and of course we'll assume that the prosecutor would have kept the promise, and had Hayes pleaded guilty, he would have been sentenced to five years. But the prosecutor said to Hayes that if he decided instead to go to trial and was convicted, of passing the bad check for $88, the prosecutor would invoke the three strikes law and Hayes would be sentenced to life. Hayes, perhaps not believing the prosecutor's threat or perhaps thinking he could be acquitted of this felony after losing in so many earlier ones, refused the plea bargain, went to trial, was convicted of passing the bad check for $88, and at the prosecutor's motion, was sentenced to life under the three strikes law. <clears throat> in earlier cases, the Supreme Court had said that prosecutors couldn't act vindictively against defendants in plea bargaining. It was okay to play hardball with them, but you couldn't treat them specially vindictively because you had something in for them, because you didn't like them, because there was something about their crime that made you particularly upset and treated them particularly harshly. It was pretty clear that the prosecutor treated Hayes harshly in this case. But the question before the court was whether this was sufficiently vindictive to allow Hayes to open the plea and thus to discipline prosecutors and tell them that they could not invoke laws like the three strikes law for the purpose of getting minor criminals like Hayes to agree to plea bargains. In answering the question, however, the court said no as it had to, because if the plea bargaining system is to work, as Justice Stewart said for the court, we must accept the simple reality that the prosecutor's interest at the bargaining table is to persuade the defendant to plead guilty. And unless the actual threat is illegal for some other reason, say that Hayes is in fact not eligible to be sentenced under the three strikes law, or the prosecutor for some other reason has no power to back up the threat, or if there is not enough evidence involved for anyone to think that Hayes has violated the three strikes law, then of course he can't be charged with it. But in this case, there was no such problem. Hayes was liable under the three strikes law. Nobody doubted that he was. And in that case, Justice Stewart said for the court, prosecutors are entitled to use that power to induce plea bargains. Otherwise, the system simply won't work. And so, despite the undignified spectacle of haggling for justice, something that causes scholars and observers from around the world to look with some justified scorn at the American way of doing criminal business, the Supreme Court has now openly acknowledged how deeply the American criminal justice system depends on plea bargaining, and so it's been able to regulate the system for efficiency and fairness openly since 1970, 
as it's continued to do all the way down to the present day from Santabello and Bordenkircher. Other systems, however, the English are what I have in mind, have in fact plea bargaining, but they haven't looked at it quite as candidly as American judges have, and this has caused problems for the English criminal justice system. 